Welcome to the Climate Diplomacy Podcast, a podcast from Adelphi, bringing you the latest insights and debates in international climate diplomacy. We are your hosts, Raquel Monayad and Hannah Kuonut. In this series, you will hear from leading experts offering their take on what needs to be done to promote climate foreign policy and provide you with the context you need to understand climate diplomacy today. For more information, please visit climate-diplomacy.org or follow us on Twitter under Climate Diplo. In this episode, we will speak about the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, or EGAD, and its approach to climate security programming across the Horn of Africa, together with Ayan Mahmoud, member of the Climate Security Expert Network. She's a senior program coordinator at EGAD, where she currently manages the USAID program portfolio and deals with issues related to resilience, climate adaptation, dryland development, cross-border health, countering violent extremism, conflict prevention, and early warning. Wow, so many really important and interesting topics, Ayan. I'm really impressed. We would like to apologize up front for any small audio disruptions due to remote recording. Ayan is joining us from a conference. So welcome, Ayan. It's a great pleasure having you as our guest today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raquel and Hannah. Thank you for having me. The pleasure is, is truly mine. Yes, welcome. <laughs> Before we get into the issue of today, let's talk a little bit about the region. So what would you say our listeners should know about the Horn of Africa? Are there important socioeconomic, geographic, or even historic aspects that are crucial to understand the region today? I would say the Horn of Africa and the Egad region is mostly known for rich wildlife and beautiful safari pictures. But here are key figures that can give us a great overview of what the Egad region is all about. The Intergovernmental Authority on Development was established in 1986, and it's composed of eight member states, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, Uganda, and Eritrea. It's a regional economic community that is one of the eight building blocks of the African Union Commission. Now, the REC was established to support and coordinate the efforts of member states towards achieving regional food security and to encourage and assist the member state effort in collectively combating drought and other natural man-made disasters and the consequences. So the IGAD region covers an area of approximately 5.2 million square kilometers and is currently populated with just over 270 million people. The current projection states that the IGAD population will reach half a billion by 2050. And among the eight of the IGAD member states, three are landlocked, specifically Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Uganda. And this highlights the strong dependence by the IGAD population on natural resources, such as rain-fed agriculture and livestock, which are highly vulnerable and most exposed to uh, climate hazards. This also implies that a large part of the IGAD population is vulnerable to food insecurity. And the latest statistics and projection states that we expect a strong annual demographic growth ranging between 2.5% and uh, 3.5%. And at present, 60% of the estimated 270 million people in the region, mostly meaning they are 30 years and below. And that new population definitely brings with them both opportunities and challenges, depending on how well this would be managed within the IGAD programs. For example, I just focus on two of the IGAD member states, uh, Sudan and South Sudan combined, for example, rank among the largest pastoralist population worldwide. About 66% of the arid land in the two countries is mainly uh, pastoralist habitat. So this, I hope, provided a small overview of what the IGAD region is all about. Thanks so much. I think it became clear that the region is so much more than all the postcard images we have in mind when we usually think about it. And I really would like to briefly look also at politics and security. So specifically, who are the different actors on the ground? When IGAD was established in 1986, it was mainly to address issues of drought and disaster across the region. Ten years later, when the country came together to revamp the regional agenda, the authority expanded to include now peace and security programs. That's where IGAD established its peace and security division and the various mechanisms to support the peace and security programs at the regional level. So we've established the IGAD 
conflict early warning and response mechanism, C1, in 2002, through various declarations, the declaration of Khartoum, the Bersiban Protocol, and so on and so forth. Now, with C1, we were able to set up a mechanism at several levels. Of course, the IGAD institution operates at regional level, but it also has clear and distinct linkages with our member states and at various levels, local and subnational with C1, we were able to establish several committees and networks at national level that now includes not only the line ministries, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also the National Research Institution that we're able to provide now an analysis of received patterns and trade and trends, conflict trends specifically, based on the database, the data that were collected at geographic location across the region. In addition to the conflict early warning mechanism, we also established a security sector program that now deals with transnational and organized crime, that deals with the maritime security, and we also established IGAD Center of Excellence for Preventing and Countering Violent Extremism that has now a clear strategy of action across the region. Ian, since you've mentioned national levels, I'd be curious to know if there are any marked differences between the countries in the Horn of Africa. I mean, we know we're talking about different countries with distinct languages, histories, and cultural backgrounds, of course, but are there any differences in regards to IGAD's work? There are differences, but also similarities across the countries in the region. From the 60 conflict early warning issues that are currently of significant concern in the IGAD region, an expert workshop validated a regional report and they prioritize nine key conflict issues with high potential of becoming violent. So those issues are similar across the region. And comes first is youth unemployment. Of course, it includes the pandemic and mismanaged electoral processes, land and natural resource-based dispute, violent extremism, interstate conflict, proliferation of small arms and light weapons, but also issues of extreme climatic condition that can now make the regional population vulnerable to conflict and violence. Thanks. Super interesting that this climate aspect is actually already identified as one of the drivers of insecurity in the region that affects all countries. And to conclude this short deep dive into the region, if you would need to identify the most important climate security pathways for the region, how would they look like? I would say they are, in essence, complex and are very intertwined. The pathways through which climate and conflict factors in the region are manifested generally determined by uh, a combination of exposure to hazard, vulnerability, and the coping capacity of the regional communities. And as you may know, the Horn of Africa is one of the most vulnerable regions to climate change and climate variability. Some of the key aspects that define the, the IGAD region is the fact that 60 to 70 percent of the IGAD region is arid and semi-arid land and the agropastoral production system, which predominantly is depending on rainfall. So prolonged and current recurrent period of drought, the intense desertification and soil erosion, the diminishing and depleting land productivity and the changing of grazing pattern affects and increase the susceptibility and the likelihood of security risks for the marginalized group. And that brings in various aspects of the broad spectrum of the security concept that now involves also issues of violent extremism, the susceptibility of marginalized groups to be recruited into violent and extremist groups, and the security responses that now should confound the fragility and impending on human rights. Remember, in the IGAD region, pastoralism is a dominant economic activity and the main source of livelihood for a majority of the population in the arid and extreme area of the home. So when you see water holes and rivers that have dried up, leading to a widespread of crop failure and migration of people, and thereby a migration of pastoral community being triggered, and that now in the risk of conflict over scarce resources, the risk of family separation. So you have a big range of pathways through which in the Igad region, climate and conflict factors are manifesting. Thank you so much, Ayan. It's very useful to understand these dynamics, also for us to move forward. And for those of you who would like to dive in deeper into the Horn of Africa, the analysis from Sagal Bashir from the Climate Security and Expert Network will also be linked in this episode's description. But I think this gives us a good basis and also the right background to move on to the main issue we we're addressing today. So we would like to give our listeners an idea of what the IGAD does. So you already mentioned some of the main reasons why the IGAD came to existence to combat food insecurity, which is a topic very dear to my heart, and also drought. We know why it came into existence, but what does it do today and what is its main function in the region, just in general, but also, of course, in light of climate security in the Horn of Africa? 
And Ika, as I said, we view climate security as a complex question, generally, and it has different aspects and different pathways through which we address the climate and security risk in the region. We first identify the drivers of security risk. We have, for example, competition over natural resources. You have the migration and mobility and the small arms proliferation. You have the worsening of livelihood. Definitely have the political and economic aspect of it. And with that, these strong leakages with climate. On the other hand, you have the climate-induced drought that has definitely resulted in resource scarcity. You also have an increasing risk of communal conflict due to a worsening livelihood. There is a direct dependency on renewable resources, on seasonal agro-pastoral movement. So all those aspects now bring together the climate security agenda in the Igat region, I would say. Thank you. And do you have maybe some success stories from your work that you could share with us? I think the world is needing some success stories nowadays. That would definitely be what we need in the region specifically. When the Horn was faced with a severe drought in 2010, one of the, the severe droughts in 2010 and 2011, the countries came together and developed a regional response to drought. And that regional response now, they took into consideration the conflict aspect and the security aspects. With that strategy, we were, maybe I should probably brief you about what the strategy was all about and how that came together. It came after realizing that there was an imperative to work as a region. The impact may be also felt at national level, but we ought to bring the regional thinking to drive this regional agenda. So what the country decided was to align relief with development and prefer investing towards long-term planning. They defined a strategy that was holistic and multisectoral and being proactive and preventive instead of being just reactive. They also identified some key geographic area. I remember I said the Igat region is mostly arid, some arid land, and these are marginalized areas most of the time. So the regional agenda spearhead investment in the arid, some arid land through building resilience and sustainability for the community, that the postal community that are present on the ground. The strategy that was developed afterwards has eight priority area of action. And among the eight, you'd have the common one, I would say, the environment and natural resource management. You would have the enhanced production and livelihood diversification. You would also have the disaster risk management and preparedness. But to those, we add key aspects that we thought would be of critical for action at regional level and included a conflict prevention and resolution component into it, the human capital and social development that now takes into consideration questions around gender and social inclusion. And then, of course, the research and knowledge management aspect of it. So when it was developed in 2013 and launched soon afterwards, over the past eight years, nine years, IGAD as a secretariat and as a REC have managed to accelerate investment with its member state for cross-border area in arid or semi-arid land. We were able to improve the access for the agricultural community to sustainably manage water resources. We were able to reduce conflict related to access to natural resources. We were able to enhance and improve the regulatory framework and facilitate the member state capacity for trade, thereby improving their livelihoods. We were able to operationalize some key disaster risk management policies and set up contingency and disaster risk funds. We are in the process of setting up an emergency and disaster operational center. We were able to expand the pastoral risk early warning and response system, and we're heading towards an integrated early warning system for early action. So we have very good success stories across the region, whereby our community's needs were attended to and listened to. But of course, you see that drought is a recurrent phenomenon in the IGAD region. And as we continue to implement the resilience activities, as we've been doing for the past eight, nine years, more is needed. More is definitely needed so that we can address and expand the reach of IGAT to those who are in need in the arid, semi-arid lands in the region. This is really nice to hear because I think in the public discourse, when we talk about climate change and we talk about local solutions, it's generally a very open topic. We talk about it, but we don't talk about the solutions themselves as much as we should. And I think this is a great example of locals getting together, of a region connecting and just looking for solutions for their problems mm -hmm. from within. And I think that's great. So it's very nice to hear the kind of work that you're doing on a more concrete basis. Of course, we know not everything is perfect. There's not just unicorns and rainbows. As you mentioned, there's a lot of space for improvement. And maybe you can highlight for us a few things that you think that could improve moving along and also what you would like to change that isn't working. 
We've tried as much as possible over the past few years to integrate conflict-sensitive approaches to resilience programming. Probably one of the key areas whereby we try to improve and see and continue sensitizing our partners would to integrate conflict-sensitive approaches and thereby ensure that we first understand the drivers that might exacerbate or maintain or initiate any conflict prior to developing any program. But we need to probably also to understand that development in a conflict-affected environment, as I said, the potential to either exacerbate the conflict or control to be to peace. We also tried to sensitize our partners in defining and developing some gender sensitive program that designed now to fit the context whereby we promote social cohesion, economic and ecological sustainability. What we would hope that uh, will bring to the region the change that we hope to bring to the region is long-term planning and a vision for a theory of change. And, and what we tell is that like everyone needs to be a bit more patient. The emerging trust that we, we gathered along our action in the region, tackling youth unemployment, youth unemployment had come first in our regional analysis of age risk. So tackling youth in, in employment is one of the emerging trends. The urbanization and migration, understanding whether it's a strategy or a shock, the challenges that are now due to crossover for in-migration as well as moving to another region to settle for various reasons. It can be for security, for access to resources, or even for labor. The issues around land grabbing, land tenure, land governance, now that the question remains, is the third for pastoralism as, as a livelihood system? The other security issues, like cattle rustling, which started as a social aspect, to it, but from there on it moved towards maybe a transnational crime whereby you'd have organized crime that could be involved. You have the trafficking and smuggling and any other transnational crime that comes out as an emerging trust. And then there is the intricate balance of survival of livestock, whereby in addition to disease control and, and providing water and pasture, you also have peace that is now critical in ensuring the survival of livestock and pastoralists. So yes, there are many areas of further improvement. I haven't even touched on the funding mechanism that exists for resilience and climate security in general. We are still very much siloed. You see the climate change aspect on one side, all the funds available for climate change program on one side, You'd have the funding available for security, for governance on the other side, and very few programs provide that flexibility to merge both issues. It's not as simple and as linear as we would think. Yes, there are many things to address. Thanks for sharing, Ayan. And you already touched upon the issue of money. So when looking at the practicalities of how EGAD is doing climate security programming across the Horn of Africa, could you tell us a bit more about them, including also financial requirements? Because I think we all know Money makes the world go round, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, as you heard. IGAT has a long tradition of institutional efforts across the region to reduce vulnerability and build resilience. In essence, IGAT, we tackle the question as one IGAT. We would start with the climate outlook provided by uh, the two sister organization, C1 for the conflict and the IGAT Climate Prediction Application Center for ICPAC for the climate outlook. And from there on, we move to identifying entry points where we can address those climate security risks. And that could also include and encompasses the political aspect, providing the necessary policy advisory to our leader so that we're able to raise additional resources when they are addressing the global community. But you see, for financial requirements, all this still remained in the specific area of engagement. For example, the climate change agenda slowly, I think, understands and encompasses issues of security risk, but there's still a lot that remains to be done in terms of sharing the resources and, and bringing the other partner across the table. And what about the broader role of regional organizations regarding climate security? Does EGAD work together with other organizations? And if yes, how do you do so? We work with many different development partners and UN agencies. We worked and raised resources for our member states. So for that, we set up the regional dialogue mechanism to coordinate this agenda at regional level. It's a multi-level platform that also encompasses the African Union, the, our eight member states, and a broad spectrum of development and humanitarian actors that includes now the international non-governmental organization, the non-state actors at local, subnational, and regional and global level. The financial institution, such as the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the European Union is also part of it. And that platform regularly meets to review the gains made and to identify gaps for common action. Coordination is a key aspect of our work at regional level. It's not an easy one. It's absolutely not an easy one. But it's something that everybody and all partners have committed to it through the agency agenda and the agency platform. 
So the African Union has a continental warning system. What I wanted to ask you, is this linked to your work? And also in general, how do you coordinate your climate security work with the African Union? Or how would you say this could be improved? When we set up the IGAD civil, uh, the conflict early with mechanism, we also set up working relation with the AU African Union conflict early warning system. So yes, we provide information. C1 collects the information at national, subnational and regional level and share that information with AU continental conflict early warning system. Yes. So I'm wondering what does this all mean for policies and negotiations for the United Nations Security Council? But maybe we can start from the beginning. How is IGAD connected to the UN Security Council? And where or why does it play a role regarding climate security? It's always touched with the representation of an ICAD member state at the UN Security Council. And I think this time around, it's Kenya who is representing the region at the UN Security Council. With that being said, within ICAD region, we establish a regional security cooperation framework at ministerial level. Five of our member states came together and identified the necessity to set up a forum, a ministerial level forum. And that forum now has the main function of identifying issues and questions that would require a joint action. Five of the IGAD member states thereby established in 2016 a regional security and cooperation framework at ministerial level. So the main task of the forum includes setting up the regional consultation and dialogue on common security issues and definitely identifying issues for promoting the confidence and security building measures. That from the regional level, we move to the continental and the global level. That's where we connect with uh, the UN Security Council and we aim to link that regional forum with the UN Security Council and the resolution that comes from the forum could now be brought to the attention of the global leaders. So interesting to hear on how many levels you engage in climate security work. And more generally speaking, what capacities do you think are missing and what would you need going forward with your climate security work? So are these more things like climate data, trainings, experts, analysis, or maybe completely different things? No, you're absolutely correct on climate data. Remember, I told you, don't start with identifying the climate-related security risk at all levels, so regional, national, at local level. And in order to mitigate those climate-related security risks, you need an improved and systematic data collection and analysis across the region across the climates and conflict spheres, and that now means strengthening the integrated early warning systems that exist. I would say it equally requires joint action-oriented data analysis, trainings, how to compile and, and combine that data received and analyze the different patterns among the climate change scenarios, the conflict partners across the sub-regional and government agencies in the Horn of Africa. So yes, there's a various level of support that is required and definitely we aim to work with everybody. And personally, I'm very interested in the topic of gender and climate security. So in your opinion, how could projects and programs make sure to include gender dimensions into their climate security work? And how does IGA do this? Gender and women, their role and rights most of them considered sensitive topics across pastoralist groups in the Horn of Africa. But there's a changing reality of pastoralism that results from the climate extreme and conflict and displacement that have led to an evolving life change for pastoralist women and girls. For example, in pastoral areas with extreme drought, livestock uses have impoverished the household. It is the women who feed the family by gathering wild food. And yet they have less access to financial resources, to land, education, health, and other basic rights than, than women. They are also seldom involved in decision-making processes. And their limited access to resources and decision-making process increase their vulnerability to impact of climate change. Now, with regard to security, there is persuasive evidence that inclusion of civil society in general and women in particular in peace and security dialogue reduce chances of failure by as much as two-thirds. I think the research said 64%. So there's a value and we aim at IGAD to develop along with a conflict-sensitive program so that we would promote that social cohesion and integration of women in all aspects of decision-making. Perfect. And if you were asked to advise someone on how to develop the perfect climate security programming, how would that advice look like? So what are key elements and aspects that one must take in account when doing climate security programming? 
Or, or in other words, what is the holy grail of climate security programming? Someone should know this answer. Maybe you do. <laughs> well, it's a really interesting concept, but it's also a complex one. It's a multi-entry development question with many different pathways to address the climate risk and the security risk, specifically and especially in the IGAT region. So what we say for IGAT, for example, the holy grail, as it say, of a regional climate security program would start with an integrated early warning for an early action. That means we reproduce the concrete outlook for the region and compile it from information received from national and some national field monitors. With that, we overlay it with the climate outlook with the same level of analysis, subnational, national, and regional. Once we are able to provide the necessary climate and security advisory outlook, we move now to develop a resilience and livelihood development program that now includes and encompasses all aspects of natural resource management, livelihood diversification, access across the trade and promoting regional trade. We are also in an area where at EU level, at continental level, we are promoting a continental free trade area. We also set up the necessary policy dialogue and regional mechanism for coordinated action across the organization, but also across the region. And we reach out to our partners at global level so that the action is a sustainable one, but it also address the needs of the community expressed by the community at local and subnational level. So yes, we try as much as possible to promote social cohesion and linking the regional climate security agenda to our global sustainable development agenda. We just spoke to Ayan Mahamoud, Senior Program Coordinator at the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, or IGAD, in Eastern Africa. She gave us an overview of the IGAD region, comprising eight states in the Horn of Africa, about 207 million people, and 5.2 million square kilometers and constituting one of the building blocks of the African Union. She told us about the IGAD's expansion from its original focus on food security and natural disasters such as drought, to cover peace and security, early warning responses, and the prevention and countering of violent extremism and organized crime. Ayan went through IGAD's nine priority actions for addressing security in the region, highlighting youth unemployment as one of the most pressing factors. She also mentioned that exposure to hazards, vulnerability, and coping capabilities of regional communities are key determinant pathways that lead climate change to translate into security risks in the Horn of Africa. Some aspects that would improve IGAD's work pertain to long-term planning, higher consideration for matters related to gender issues and land issues, and the integration of conflict-sensitive approaches prior to implementation of projects on the social and climatic spheres. We couldn't agree more with this last one. As we always say, integrated programming only works properly if it is already considered in the project design phase and not just as an afterthought. Ayan also highlighted that IGAD's work with the United Nations Security Council through member state representation, which is currently led by Kenya. The organization has developed its own security cooperation framework, setting up regional dialogues and linking the regional to the global levels. To move forward and continue expanding the scope of its work, more data and more concise data analysis will be needed. And finally, we've asked her what is the holy grail of climate security programming. And she told us, it is integrated early warning overlaid with climate outlooks. This allows for creating realistic scenarios and developing informed responses. Thank you very much to our expert Ayan Mahmoud for giving us her diverse insights on climate security in the Horn of Africa region and sharing her expertise about climate security programming. It was a great pleasure having you with us today. Before we go, we'd like to give a shout out to the Climate Bridge podcast, a podcast hosted by the Transatlantic Climate Bridge, which promotes and facilitates transatlantic cooperation on climate and energy policy between Germany, the US and Canada. Their podcast interviews transatlantic climate policy actors from government to civil society to the private sector to give behind the scene looks at the latest climate policy developments and processes. Their first episode, a conversation with German member of parliament, Lisa Badum, dropped in February with four more episodes to come in the run of the year. Check out the Climate Bridge podcast on your favorite podcast provider. And we will be back soon with another episode of the Climate Diplomacy podcast in a few weeks. You can reach us with questions and feedback on Twitter at Climate Diplo. Thank you for tuning in. And until next time, goodbye.